Hey, and welcome back to the One Block of Bedrock survival series, where we go from one block of bedrock in vanilla-ish Minecraft to basically a skyblock-like setup. So you may remember in my last episode, I desperately tried to get lightning to strike and ignite my nether portals. Of course, it didn't work out too well because waiting for extremely rare random events in order to progress is not a good idea. Speaking of, this episode I'm going to try and get a wandering trader to spawn in and sell me some blocks of moss. Now this is a super good idea for the path of progression, because moss blocks right now can provide us with an infinite supply of trees thanks to whatever this sapling like thing is, and later on moss blocks will provide us with an infinite supply of dirt. The only downside to doing this is that wandering traders will only attempt to spawn in once every 20 minutes, and during that spawn attempt there's only a 7.5% chance that that spawn attempt will even progress to the point where it has to find a block to spawn in on. And this is where things get a little complex with probabilities, so I'm going to save this part for a bit later on. For now, we'll just put a question mark on that number and hope it isn't too bad. While I was recording this episode, I didn't know this number, so you're going to get to experience it like I did. Oh, and also, there's only a 5 in 61 chance the Wandering Trader will sell moss. This means that, ignoring the chance of the villager finding a block to spawn on, it should take around 54 hours to spawn in the villager. So yeah, the spawn timer for a wandering trader is kind of ridiculous. But at the end of the last episode, I said that I had an idea as to how we could maybe make the wandering trader spawn in consistently. And that idea was based around the 20 minute spawn timer of the wandering trader. If we were able to find out when that spawn timer was about to pop, and exit the game just before that, then we could make something like 10 different backups of our world file, and then open each one of those 10 backups individually. That means that as soon as we load into one of those world files, the wandering trader will have a chance to spawn, and then we can quickly move on to the next one. If we use this approach, we could effectively eliminate the 20 minute spawn timer from the wait. But unfortunately, that's not how the game code works. The code for spawning in wandering traders checks once every minute since the time where the game started. So that means if we're loading a new backup every time we want to test it, we'll have to wait one minute in that world every time we want to check for a spawn. So what this means is that instead of waiting 20 minutes for a mob to spawn, we can wait one minute. This significantly reduces the amount of time I'll have to spend waiting around, but given the short intervals of AFKing, I'll have to be at my computer the entire time actively monitoring what's going on. So I guess I'm not actually AFKing at all. Anyway, with the theory crafting done, let's get back to the actual gameplay. While I was doing all this mob farming you've been seeing in the background for the past 3 minutes, I actually got a wandering trader to spawn in just by chance. Of course, this guy didn't have any moss blocks to trade, otherwise this video would be structured a whole lot differently. And it was around this point where I was thinking, hey, the chances can't be too bad. If I got one to spawn in by accident while I was just doing other stuff, how long could it possibly take me to get these guys to spawn in if I'm actively trying to? Yeah, it, it took a while. So to give you an example of what I did here, we're going to go through an entire setup for me trying to get a wandering trader to spawn in just once. So the first step to this process is finding out how soon the world is going to spawn in a wandering trader. And I want to be upfront about this. I looked at the game's save file to find out what this number was. In theory, I could have derived this time myself using what I know about the game, and that time I got the Wandering Trader to spawn. But for the sake of my sanity, that is not what I did. Now, there are plenty of arguments either way saying if this is vanilla Minecraft or not. And my personal take on it is that if you copy your save file over to a new location, that is a parallel dimension. And if someone in that parallel dimension was to open up the world file and have a look inside, then they would only be finding out details about what's inside that parallel dimension. That means that the original world file, which never got opened up, is still safe. It's still vanilla Minecraft, and I never touched this original world file. Or you could say that I use external tools. That is a completely fair argument as well. Anyway, using the parallel dimension and some external tools, I looked at the number for how long it would be until a wandering trader spawn attempt was made. If that number was longer than a minute, I would just go back to the main world and wait for a while. Eventually, I'd end up with the main world having less than a minute left on its spawn timer for the wandering trader. At that point, I would close out of it and make 30 copies of that game file. From there, I would then go into each one of those 30 duplicated worlds 
and try to get a wandering trader to spawn. Now, just to give you some context as to the suffering I went through, and so you have an idea how long this took, we're going to go through one of these times as an example. So for every attempt in this batch, I would have to go into the chest and grab a bunch of emeralds, then I would end up pilling up to a point where I could see all of the base. I need to see into the mob farm to see if any wandering traders have spawned up there. Since the wandering trader is equally likely to spawn on any given block in the base, and most of the blocks in the base are up in the mob farm, I want to be up here so I can see it spawn. Now it is a bit silly doing it this way, because I could have grabbed the emeralds from the chest and pull it up before I duplicated the world file, and then I wouldn't have to do this 30 times over, but I didn't do that because I'm an idiot. I mean, to be fair, I was going to have to be in-game actively-ish looking at my computer while this was happening, so it wasn't the worst idea ever. Yeah, there's a bit of waiting. But when the 60 second mark hits, I check up top to see if there's anything up here, and then I check down below. Unfortunately, this attempt didn't result in a wandering trader. But what about the other attempts in my batch of 30? Well, in that batch of 30, I got a total number of zero. Now, that set off a few alarm bells for me, because I knew there was a 7.5% chance of it spawning, and in 30 attempts, I should have been getting two and a quarter villagers to spawn. But at the time, I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Maybe I was just getting unlucky. I mean, after all, I did get a villager to spawn without doing anything just before. So from here, I decided to do a few things before my next attempt. Most importantly, I moved the chicken out of the mob farm into a safer place. I wasn't very good at moving the chicken, so it took a while, but there we go. The chicken's in his nice little home, and he'll be staying there forever. Or she. Anyway, after that, I left my computer on for a while, so I could get some XP for my pickaxe, and a bunch of drops from the mobs. Right now, I'm about to do something absolutely mind-blowing. I'm going to put the pickaxe in my left hand. Yeah, I didn't know you could do this. Thanks for pointing it out. I, I feel really stupid now. Oh, another feature. The mob farm now has a roof on it. I showed it earlier on in some background footage. But yeah, this means we can now get skeletons and zombies to accumulate over the day. Which is really cool. Because zombies have some really useful drops like the iron ingots and potato. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get much use of those rare drops until we get our moss block. So let's get back to that grind. Once again, I waited until the world was at the point where it was just about to try and spawn a wandering trader, and then I made 30 copies. So how did these 30 copies go? Well, on my 5th or 6th attempt, I got this to happen. A wandering trader has just spawned, let's see what he's got, and it's, uh, it's not moss. Okay, let's see how the rest of the batch went. Huh. Yeah, there were no wandering traders. Okay, cool. So, at this point, I have done 60 attempts, and I've gotten one Wandering Trader to spawn. I'm feeling this 7.5% chance isn't very accurate, and there's probably something I'm missing. But, I mean, I only have to get a Wandering Trader to spawn in once with a moss block, and maybe it's faster to just keep going with this random attempt than trying to fix what is wrong with my base. Surely I can just get one wandering trader to spawn, and then this whole ordeal can be over, and it won't matter what process I went through. So I decided to do another batch of 30. And during this batch of 30, I got zero wandering traders. Yeah, that, that, that's great, and another 30 batch without any wandering traders. But, you know, I might just get a wandering trader to spawn in soon, so let's try another batch of 30. No wandering traders again. So, so that's 60 attempts in a row without a single wandering trader, by the way. And if you include most of the last batch, that's like 80 attempts in a row, no wandering trader. <sighs> okay, let's keep going. Let's do one more batch. So what happened during this batch? Well, this happened. Yeah, there were no wandering traders again. That is like... 110 attempts in a row without a wandering trader. Yeah, this is killing me. I'm gonna go for a break and explore the end for a bit. I still need to get some more iron and emeralds from the end cities, so, you know, this isn't a complete waste of time.
and we finally made it to an in-city. This one's especially cool because it has a chance of dropping us Elytra, so we can fly around our tiny little base. I mean, to be fair, Elytra are pretty useless, since right now they only serve as gliders, and if you fall below the base, you can't exactly glide up to get back on it, so the use cases of Elytra are pretty narrow right now. But still, there are plenty of other things in the in-city that we're really interested in. Of course, there's the iron and emeralds, which I mentioned earlier, but this is also a great opportunity to get a whole bunch of new blocks for the base. The purple blocks will be great for decoration, but the one I really want to harvest from this place is the end rods. End rods are basically just torches. They emit the same level of light, and they look kinda similar. It'll be a while until we can get normal torches in our base, so getting a bunch of end rods now will be super useful. Also, just like last time, my main source of food for this thing is going to be Chorus Root. This kind of sucks, because every time you get hit and need to heal up, you end up teleporting back to the start of the base. So, effectively, this makes the end city a no-hit run, where I can't take any damage or else I'll have to risk getting reset. Although, to be fair, Chorus Root are really good at getting out of nasty situations, so, you know, they're not the worst. In this first chest, I get a bunch of cool loot like an efficiency for pickaxe, and I quickly teleport out. For the next attempt, I try and go for another one of the chest rooms. I try to kill the shulker, but inevitably just get flung up into the air, and then I decide to try and access the chest from outside the base. I end up tunneling around the outside, and I'm able to get the chest without any real danger, so that's pretty cool. This one has a diamond chest plate, so I'm quick to swap to that. Nice. Then, for siege attempts number 3, I go in the third possible direction. I soon realised though that this tower doesn't have any chests in it, and I was just wasting my time. For siege attempts number 4, I remember that I'm also here to get blocks, so I go attacking everything purple that I see. I even find a cool banner before I eventually have to teleport down. Then siege attempt number 5 ends up going pretty quickly, so let's talk about siege attempt number 6, where I go for the final chest in the base, I think. It's been a while since I recorded this, so I think I got all the chests, but who knows. Anyway, this chest has a bunch of diamonds and 10 iron. 10 iron is a fantastic amount by the way, because it gives us enough to make a cauldron and bucket. This means we'll have access to water, which means we'll have access to drowned, which means we'll have access to copper as a rare drop from the drowned, and that copper can then be built into a lightning rod to light the nether portal. Yeah, there's a whole massive path of progression we're building towards here, and having the iron is incredibly important, so I'm glad to have it. Although, at this point, I'm not quite sure how good the whole filling a cauldron with rainwater thing is going to go. I've heard it's quite slow, so maybe we will end up using the villager trade to buy a full bucket of water. But we'll see what happens with that when we get to it. For now, we are on the final siege attempt, and I'm trying to get towards the ship. I end up doing something slightly risky here. Going for the enderpeel shot, and yeah, it's fine. Now it's time to loot this place. By the way, I completely forgot that there were two chests in here, so that was a really nice surprise. Anyway, let's get the Elytra and a bunch of gold, pretty cool. A diamond sword, yeah, I don't have one of those yet, so that's nice. And in the other chest, there is a bunch of diamonds plus some helmets. Nothing amazing, but loot is loot, so I'm pretty happy to get it. Now, I can't take everything home with me, since my inventory is basically running out at this point. And I also can't make any shulker boxes, because you have to make that recipe in a crafting table. So I'm going to leave a little bit of stuff behind, but still, it's been an amazing haul, and it's time to go back to base. Oh, also check this out. I place a block behind the portal, so when I throw an enderpeel in, I don't get trapped outside. Very useful. So now that we're back at base, I'm going to do a little bit of inventory management to sort out my loot. I realise around here that I definitely should have taken back some of those chests I found, because I'm going to have to store half the stuff in my inventory from now on, so hopefully I don't fall out of the map. Hopefully. I also take a little bit of time to remodel the base just a bit, and then there's also a rainstorm, so 
you know, I gotta do what I gotta do. I don't know why I'm still expecting lightning to strike me at this point, and honestly, I would be pretty disappointed if it did happen, since I put so much effort into this whole mitigation plan with the Wandering Trader. To recap, I've done 150 spawn attempts so far for this guy, and he's only turned up twice. Now, earlier in the video, when I went through the spawning requirements and time estimates for spawning in a Wandering Trader, I said that there was a 7.5% chance of them spawning. But I didn't bother looking into the chances of the spawning algorithm finding a block for it to spawn in on. At that point during recording, I didn't even realise it could be an issue. But right now, the numbers tell me that our results of 2 spawns in 150 attempts aren't quite reaching that 7.5% number. We're actually getting about a 1.3% spawn rate, which is like a sixth of what we should be getting. So I looked into the game code to find out what was going on, and I can't legally show you the game code, and also looking at code sucks in a YouTube video, so here is a terrible drawing of what I found. So to find a spawn location for the Wandering Trader, the game is going to make 10 attempts to find a location. Each attempt will select a random X and Z coordinate in a 96 by 96 area centered on the player. From that X and Z coordinate, the highest up block will be chosen and checked to see if it's able to spawn in a mob. So if that X and Z coordinate lands on an end stone block in our base, we'll get a mob to spawn and we'll be happy. But if that randomly selected block ends up being a half slab, like an enchanting table, or no block at all, like the endless void surrounding our base, then the spawn attempt will fail. This effectively means that the chances of a wandering trader spawning on a given spawn attempt is just the number of spawnable blocks in our base divided by the entire search area. I've chosen a value of 500 to approximate the size, which should give us a 5% chance of finding a spawn location per spawn attempt. But remember, the game does 10 spawn attempts, so what are our chances of finding it within those 10? Well, to calculate that chance, the easiest way of doing it is to calculate the chances that the game won't find a single spawn attempt in 10 attempts. If the chances of not finding a spawn location is just 1 minus the chances of finding a spawn location, then the chances of doing that 10 times in a row is just that to the power of 10. So we end up with this equation here, which says that our chances of not finding a single valid spawn attempt in 10 tries is 57%. That means our chances of finding at least one valid spawn attempt is 1 minus that, or 43%. So that means we have a 43% chance of finding a spot for the Wandering Trader to spawn in on if our base has a surface area of 500 blocks. I think at this point in time, our base has a surface area of around 350 blocks, so our base has about a 30% chance. Now if we plug these numbers back into our 150 attempts, we should have expected to see 3.4 villagers spawn, so I guess there was a bit of bad luck after all. So obviously, the thing we want to do here is expand the surface area of our base and increase the chances of a spawn being successful. There is a little bit of diminishing returns later on, but for now, any time we invest in expanding the surface area of our base will massively pay off in terms of the time we have to spend waiting for a mob to spawn. Plus, we'll also get a bigger mob farm, so it's a win-win. Oh, and also, before I built this thing, I did try another 30 attempts to get the villager to spawn, and nothing happened, so that's 180 attempts with two villagers spawning in. Not so cool. But what is cool is the little base I made to AFK in. Look, it's even got a little window in the back. Anyway, the rest of the build was pretty uneventful. I placed some blocks, and then I went and dug up some more blocks. The new diamond pickaxe I got from the end city was amazing here. This thing had efficiency 4 on it, which I was not used to, and it felt so quick. Unfortunately, there was no mending on this pickaxe, so once it got to 1 durability, it had to spend the rest of its life in a chest. Or at least until we got an anvil, but that's not going to be anytime soon. Eventually, I was able to get the farm to a pretty decent size. This thing is way bigger than it was before, so surely the chances of spawning at a wandering trader will be a lot higher. So let's see what we can get from 30 attempts now. Ah. I got nothing. That's really unfortunate. I, actually, I hope it's unfortunate and there isn't something I'm missing in the code here. I hope I'm just getting unlucky. Let's do 30 more attempts and see what happens. Okay, cool, that's nothing. Yep, that's 60 attempts in a row with the big farm and nothing. 
So at this point, I'm wondering if I've done something completely wrong with my math or with my general life choices leading up to this. And my resolution to those thoughts was to not think about them and just try again for another 30 attempts. What could possibly go wrong? Well, actually, not much. I got a wandering trader on my third go. And now it's just a question of what he's selling. There's a 5 in 61 chance of Moss, and I'm kind of excited that my work's paid off to get a wandering trader to spawn at all. So I wouldn't mind if this guy isn't selling Moss. And of course he isn't selling Moss, because why would he? This guy is selling melon seeds though, and I don't think there's an easy way of getting these later on, so I'm thinking it's a good idea to buy them now, just in case. I'll still have enough emeralds for moss later on, and I'm not really looking to spend my emeralds on anything else. This also means we have to stop this spawn attempt session, because there's no point searching any more parallel dimensions if we've already found a parallel dimension that we want to go forward with. So that means from the 63 parallel dimensions that we explored, we got one wandering trader to spawn. Now, I don't think that means the probability is 1 in 63, since we stopped on a success. But I also don't know if that does not mean the probability is 1 in 63. Anyway, from here, I had to leave my game open for about an hour to reset the wandering trader spawn timer. Once it was back down to a minute, and the spawn chance was back at 7.5%, I made some copies of the world and got back to the grind. Now, the weird thing about the Wandering Trader spawn timer is that it's exactly the same time as the day-night cycle. However, the Wandering Trader spawn timer can only decrease once per minute since the time the world started up. That means that if you spent 30 seconds in a world and then closed it, the Wandering Trader spawn timer wouldn't actually decrease at all, but the day-night cycle time would increase by 30 seconds. This eventually means that the day-night cycle and the Wandering Trader spawn timer will fall out of sync. And if they get far enough out of sync, the Wandering Trader will start spawning in the middle of the night, meaning I have to check on the mob farm in the middle of the night. And this went about as well as you might have expected. I made 30 copies of my world file to do 30 attempts of getting the Wandering Trader to spawn here, but this was the only one I actually went through with. I think you can tell why I didn't keep doing more attempts with getting it to spawn in the middle of the night. Also, if you die in an alternate dimension, it definitely doesn't count. After doing that, I went back to the main dimension, and I decided to wait around in the world to try and resynchronize the timers. If I opened the world for 50 seconds at a time, I could advance the day-night cycle by 50 seconds without increasing the Wandering Trader spawn timer. By doing this enough times, I was eventually able to get the Wandering Trader spawning in at a normal time of day. Or at least doing its spawn attempts at a normal time of day. Because I did another 30 attempts, and I got zero Wandering Traders. Yeah, that didn't go too well, so I copied my save file 50 more times, and on the 48th attempt, I got this guy to spawn, and sell me some useless stuff I don't need. For my next few attempts, I did something that I should have done a long time ago. I pulled it up to the top of the mob farm before I duplicated my world files. Honestly, I have no idea why I wasn't doing this earlier. I've done 323 spawn attempts so far. And only now am I starting the spawn attempts in a spot that doesn't require me pillowing up all the way to the top of the mob farm. This makes things so much easier. And now that I don't have to work as hard for each attempt, it's time for a massive grind. Let's see what I can get in 50 alternate dimensions. So on my fourth or so attempt, I get this guy spawning in here with a Pozzol trade. I was kind of tempted to make this one, but I only have three emeralds left, so doing this would bankrupt me. Maybe let's keep going and see what else we can get. Not too long later, on my 25th attempt, I got this guy spawning in on the site here. Unfortunately, he jumped straight into the mob channel, and he ended up with all the creepers. This was a little dangerous, so I had to play it safe. Not only were the creepers able to blow him up, but he could have fallen down the mob farm and died. So I blocked him off, and I slowly eased my way towards him to see what he had to sell. This guy had nothing, so we're going to have to keep on going. Moving on to my 39th attempt, I managed to get yet another Wandering Trader to spawn. So that's 3 Wandering Traders in 50 spawn attempts. Things are going pretty good. Unfortunately, this guy doesn't really have anything worth trading for, but you know, it's looking like our mob farm is actually producing a good number of Wandering Traders now. So let's keep going with another batch of 30. <coughs> Unfortunately, this next batch doesn't result in any Wandering Traders. But since the last batch was so good, I'm not super sad about it. What I am sad about though, is the batch of 70 that I did afterwards. From this batch of 70, I got another 0. 
So yeah, the RNG at this point is just messing with me. First it takes me through a set of 50 with 3 wandering traders, then it throws me through 100 of them without a single one spawning. Nothing is in my control at this point, and it really sucks, because I could just get a wandering trader on my next attempt, or I could do 500 more and be no closer at the end of it. So desperate times call for desperate measures. In this video, I've already stretched your imagination as to what counts as vanilla Minecraft. So using your flexible brains, think about this. Is vanilla Minecraft vanilla Minecraft? Of course it is, right? It's vanilla Minecraft. But what about four vanilla Minecrafts? Four scoops of vanilla ice cream is still vanilla ice cream. So if I run four concurrent instances of Minecraft, surely that is still vanilla Minecraft. Okay, on a more serious note, this is basically me just doing the whole parallel dimensions thing, but at the same time, instead of one after the other. Now, I am bending the rules a little bit here, but to be honest, the only other solution to this would be cheating. And I can't afford a Harvard astrophysicist, so that's off the menu. Anyway, with the four Minecraft instances running at the same time, I did 40 attempts. 10 per thing. And I was only halfway through those when I realized that I could be doing six Minecraft instances at once. So I booted up two more copies, and now we have six Minecrafts running at the same time. There are a few issues with doing this, mainly that the game is just a complete laggy mess. And there is a slight risk that the game isn't running at full speed because it's just killing my computer too much. This also made it quite difficult to track the one minute timers in all six of the worlds. What I ended up doing was using the sun to track if the time had passed. The sun travels 360 degrees around the world in 20 minutes. So that means in one minute it'll travel 18 degrees up. And if I open the F3 menu, I can keep track of how far it's moved since the time I opened the world. So once I knew that one minute had passed, I would check out the top of the farm, and then drop down to see what had spawned down below. There was also a slight risk that the wandering trader could have walked down the mob chute while I wasn't watching, so I made sure to check down below as well. With this elaborate strategy, I was finally at a point where I could get wandering traders spawning in within a reasonable amount of time. So I prepared for one final grind. I started with 10 copies of the world per instance, so 60 copies, and I wasn't going to stop until I finally got the moss block. So how long did it take me to get there? It's already been almost 500 attempts to get up to this point, so how long more did I have to spend? Well, the final moments came within 41 attempts of me starting. So I might have just got the sky to spawn really quickly without doing 6 instances of Minecraft. I also might have got the sky to spawn without expanding the mob farm, because he spawned in the lower section of my base. Yeah, you know what, there's no use complaining. I am super happy to have this guy here, because now we have moss and we can do so much with it, holy crap. These moss blocks are going to give us access to an infinite supply of wood, which means we'll be able to make crafting tables, tools, and whatever else we want. Our potential to do stuff now has just exploded, and I can't wait to use this moss block in the next part of the series. So yeah, I do think it might be time to finish things off. This episode has kind of gone on for twice as long as the other ones. And I guess it also did take twice as long to make, so yeah, sorry about the wait. Hopefully next episode will come out a bit sooner, but that was also the plan for this episode, so we'll see what happens. And I'll also try and address some of the comments you guys have left from the last episode. There are some great suggestions in there, so I'm looking forward to using them. Anyway, that's it for now, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.